Are you someone who believes that sex is intercourse? Do you often ignore what comes before and after? And has foreplay become really, really boring and predictable? These are some of the questions we're going to address in today's podcast. Hi, I'm Dr. Neelima Deshpande and this is V for Vagina, the podcast that dispels myths and misunderstandings about the vagina and empowers women to embrace their sexual energy, vitality and well-being. In this podcast, I'm accompanied by Niranjan Medekar, the CEO and founder of Sounds Great, the company that helps me create and market this podcast. He's here today to help me sort through the hundreds of questions I've started to get on social media and as well as in response to the podcasts I've done here before. Thank you, Niranjan, for helping me to answer these questions. Thank you, ma'am. Here is the first question. What is foreplay and why do couples think they either get too much or too little? That's a really interesting question because... Foreplay is defined in textbooks as anything that happens before the actual act of intercourse. Most men and women automatically assume it's what you do to get your partner turned on to be able to have intercourse with them. The truth is that anything you do in your intimate life that allows your partner to be open and receptive to your signals for sexual intimacy can be counted as foreplay. Okay. so. How does knowing one's own body make a difference to how a man or a woman shows up for their partner? The interesting thing about foreplay is that arousal is in the hands of the person who is getting aroused. Knowing if you're aroused or not can make a big difference to how you guide your partner to have great sex. Because your experience of great sex is a very individual experience. For that, you need to know your body. You need to know your own triggers for what makes you aroused and what turns you off. And then you also need the opportunity to interact with your partner in a way that these triggers can be explored. Um, For example, a woman may not always get turned on because she has her breast stimulated or because she has her genital stimulated. Sometimes a woman may be in a frame of mind where she requires more intimacy, cuddling, soothing before she can be ready for any of her erogenous zones to be stimulated. And the same woman, if she's primed herself to be aroused, might not want any other kind of foreplay. She wants to go directly to being fully aroused by having her erogenous zones stimulated. And the same thing can happen with men. It is wrong to assume that there is a fixed pattern of how a woman or a man gets turned on each and every time. And that's one of the reasons why sex can become boring. This is really important that both men and women take the time to explore their own bodies and understand what turns them on and what turns them off as well so that they can communicate this to their partner. And in many ways, this exploration individually also needs to happen at different times. So, for example, this exploration of one's ability to get aroused when different parts of the body are stimulated or touched, when you're deeply relaxed, when you're in a romantic mood, where you've just watched an erotic film, they're going to be different to when you just come back home from a drive in traffic and you're exhausted and tired, you've had an argument with your boss and you didn't meet any friends and nothing's been going your way. Then how you get aroused and how you respond to touch and sensations, whether yourself or of your partners, is going to be very different. So it's exploring yourself in different, different situations and understanding how your body responds that holds the key to communication between partners and then having a great uh, experience with sex. Okay, so like your mind, your body is also not the same at all times. Absolutely. So you need to understand that. And I think also environment also plays a vital role in orgasms or in intimacy. So ma'am, that leads to our third question, which is, is it true that women always take longer to get aroused? And what is it in foreplay that women particularly want? This is interesting because it's a myth that women always take longer to get aroused. And the trouble with the word always is that it takes away flexibility, it takes away spontaneity, and it takes away the excitement of a sexual encounter by assuming that there is a standard to be achieved 
uh, whether for men or women. Uh, so for example, men always get an erection sooner than a woman gets aroused and that's why she's always unsatisfied. So the word always is very debilitating and it's very restrictive. So I wouldn't say that women always take longer to get aroused. Women can do many things if they want to prepare to have a quickie, for example, or if they want to be aroused when the sexual encounter is anticipated or that they're ready. I'm sure all of us have uh, read about stories, <laughs> erotica and novels, where the woman is aroused just thinking about the partner she's going to meet and she's ready. Uh, she's ready to have the sexual episode that, or the sexual encounter that's being uh, described in the novel. The truth is that we are all creatures of habit and we are affected not only by our environment, but we're also affected by our emotions, our anticipation, our expectations of our partner. So I might be very, very aroused and, you know, excited because I've been reading erotica and I have built up a certain kind of image of what my partner is going to be like and how amazing it's going to be. And I show up and then my partner's just had a really bad phone call with his boss or he's just received some bad news. So in that very moment, the arousal process of both is going to be switched off. So the question of the amount of time it takes for either the man or the woman to be aroused depends on lots of circumstances. It depends on preparedness. It also depends on the physiology of the woman. For example, a woman going through menopause is definitely going to take longer to get aroused. Even though she may have uh, the libido and the desire to have intercourse, her vagina may not respond, in which case the common signs of arousal that we look for, which is vaginal lubrication and secretion and, you know, the sensation of feeling wet, that may not always happen. The same problem can also be seen in women who are on antidepressants, maybe on oral contraceptives, maybe, you know, taking anti-allergy medication, medication for overactive bladder and bladder problems, certain psychiatric medications all lead to dryness. So you might be very aroused in your head but your vagina is not responding or your genitals are not responding. And the best way around this is often to have great communication. Exactly. So how do women learn to communicate what they want in foreplay? I had an interesting case recently where the woman's complaint is, that, oh, you know, my partner doesn't know how to kiss properly. You know, his technique is really boring. He always kisses the same way. Uh, there's no exploration. He doesn't kiss the rest of my body. And then she went on to complain and complain and complain. He doesn't do this and he doesn't do that. And then I paused and I said, well, have you ever told him? He said, no. I said, well, why not? He should know. I said, well, how? He just should. He's a man. So we come across so many myths all the time. So how does a woman communicate to her man about what she wants? So typically, it's good to use the sandwich technique. So there's one, this is a technique which uh, I teach in my courses a lot. So you use a positive feedback sa and then sandwich what you want in between the next positive feedback. So you tell your man, you know what, that was an amazing, amazing way to kiss me. I really loved that. You know, I love the way you're so gentle. You're so amazing. I would really love next time if you could explore this with your tongue a little bit more or you could go a little bit deeper, you could last a little bit longer, you could use a bit more saliva, etc. And then you end with, yeah, my God, that, am that amazing experience really got me turned on. So there is a way to give feedback so that you get what you want. If you're not getting what you want, more than likely it's because of how you're communicating to your partner. Your partner is still with you and you're having intimate moments because they want you to be aroused and excited and enjoying sex. Nothing makes a man get turned on more than seeing his partner enjoy his lovemaking. So if at any point the foreplay is not how you want it, your first job is always to explore your body and find out what makes you get turned on, what is it that you absolutely enjoy and you really, 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 really want and how long you want it for and learn how to teach your partner to do what makes you get turned on and get turned on and demonstrate you're getting turned on so he knows that what's working and what's not working. Okay. So the next question is about orgasm gap. So what is the orgasm gap and how does foreplay make a difference? The orgasm gap was something that was discussed in the study that was conducted in the Netherlands when they looked at men and women and how long each one of them took to orgasm. It appeared that men had an orgasm much sooner than women. 
Men had an orgasm between 5 to 7 minutes and women took between 14 and 16 minutes to orgasm. And this difference in time was what's called the orgasm gap. The orgasm gap can lead to a lot of dissatisfaction, particularly for women, because the man orgasms, ejaculates and then turns over and either goes to sleep or goes to the bathroom. Whereas the woman is then left by herself either to stimulate herself to orgasm or then her arousal disappears and she has to wait until the man returns and then gets her going again. And this dissatisfaction can often lead to a reduced quality of life, irritation, anger, poor communication and disruption of the relationship. One of the ways foreplay can help to reduce this orgasm gap is for the man and woman to understand that when you indulge in good foreplay, where you actually help each other to get aroused to a certain peak state, before you move to intercourse, then the possibility of having an orgasm together increases. Understanding that uh, the woman's ability to get aroused and become orgasmic is also her responsibility. So it's not just the man's job or her partner's job to make her get aroused and have lots of orgasms before they have intercourse. Every woman who's entering into a sexual encounter can make sure that she is primed and ready to be aroused and become orgasmic by learning how to masturbate, learning about priming herself with erotica and sexual thoughts, by entertaining positive expectation about the encounter they're about to they're about to have and uh, learning to set boundaries between previous unpleasant experiences so that they don't interfere with her ability to get orgasmic or to become very very aroused the more aroused she already is as they enter the sexual encounter the more likely it is that she will become orgasmic closer to the same time as the man becomes orgasmic Ma'am, you are very well explaining the importance of foreplay. So the question arises, does lack of foreplay lead to painful sex? Painful sex is a complex topic because there can be many, many reasons for it and it's not just about arousal. We've talked about painful sex where, uh, number one, lack of arousal and lack of lubrication uh, can be a reason why uh, the entrance to the vagina might feel uncomfortable, tight, and therefore cause pain. If the woman is not so aroused and she's afraid of sex, her pelvic floor muscles can become very tight and her vagina may not lubricate as much because she's already in her head thinking about how it's going to hurt and how it's going to be uncomfortable and therefore she's not welcoming the experience. Painful sex can also be caused by endometriosis, pelvic inflammatory disease, vulvodynia, infections, sexually transmitted infections, traumatic uh, injuries to the vulva. Sometimes, you know, for example, women who've just had a baby and they have an episiotomy or women who've had vaginal surgery for prolapse. These are already painful conditions and they're independent of arousal. Pain can become much less or much better by using lubrication or maybe local anesthetic jelly in such conditions. Getting aroused certainly does help. So having great foreplay and understanding how the body responds to different kinds of stimulation, uh, knowing what stimuli are causing better arousal and which stimuli inhibit arousal can help the woman to prepare herself for a much more satisfactory sexual experience. The main thing is also to not practice painful sex. <laughs> I had a patient recently who has uh, sex that's very uncomfortable, it's painful and especially the first time she had sex they had a little bit of bleeding and in her head she was always like oh my god sex is always uncomfortable and they've been delaying having sex so they have sex once in every two or three months and every time it's a little bit uncomfortable. She finally managed to speak to her mother about it. Her mother is uh, in her 50s and 60s and basically concluded and told her, well, you just got to put up with it. It's always painful. That's how it's supposed to be. You get used to it. This is terrible advice. I would not suggest that women practice having painful sex <laughs> because it's a feedback loop. You get rewarded for pleasure. Enjoying the sexual experience is what makes you want to have more of it. So if you want to have a great sex life, then not having pain when you're sexually active is really important. 
if it's painful and it's six months since you've been in a sexual relationship, you've been tested for sexually transmitted infections and everything else is clear and sex is still uncomfortable, do see your gynecologist or sex therapist and make sure that sex is not painful anymore. It's not okay for sex to be painful. Absolutely. So ma'am, what are the common mistakes that men and women make in foreplay that makes sex not as pleasurable as it could be? This is a really, really good question. And uh, it goes back to that same couple I was telling you about, where both of them are making mistakes. He thinks that she doesn't like his style of foreplay, so he rushes through it. He says, if I get, it, get over it with it quickly, then maybe, 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 just maybe, you know, it'll all finish. And then... Uh, I can just go back to doing what I was doing before. And she's like, God, he's so rubbish. Can't he slow down? Oh my God, what is he doing? Why does he touch my breast this way all the time? Why, does, why can't he kiss properly? And so all this agitation that has entered their sexual encounter that every time they're anticipating being rubbish at it <laughs> and not being able to give each other feedback. So some things that can put your partner off. Number one is... A, not paying attention to personal hygiene. So having bad body odor, not looking after your oral health, having long nails that scratch or injure your partner, uh, having poor dental health, you know, so it's not pleasant to receive or give uh, kisses. Having poor genital hygiene, you know, not taking care of cleaning around the area so there's no smegma underneath the skin of the prepuce. And also for women, you know, paying attention to genital health so there's no encrustations or discharge that's accumulated between the labia. Overall, you want to make it really, really pleasant and amazing for your partner to stimulate you. Sometimes, you know, the smell uh, of a particular kind of aftershave can be off-putting, but the woman doesn't feel okay to tell the partner about it. Hair on the body is a big uh, switch off for some people, whether it's pubic hair or armpit hair or um, the hair on your head. If it's not washed, if it's not clean, it's not groomed properly, it can be a big put off. The other thing is how you touch your partner, especially when you're touching erogenous zones like breasts and genitals. There are many men who have very sensitive testes. You know, having the testes handled in a rough way or having the tip of the penis handled in a rough way can immediately put the man off because it's uncomfortable and painful. The same thing goes for women. You know, having their breasts squeezed. And remember that breast sensation changes as the woman goes through her menstrual cycle. So it's very likely that premenstrually her best breasts are more tender. I had a lady who came to see me and uh, she wanted her breasts examined. And when she took her top off, her breasts were covered in red marks. And uh, I couldn't examine her because she had trauma to her breasts from them being squeezed and hurt and massaged to the point where she was in agony. And being in pain and being afraid of pain are two of the biggest switch-offs for sex. The same thing goes for how somebody touches your tummy, around your belly button, how they explore your genitals. I mean, a lot of women who come to me don't like being fingered by their partners. So oh, his hands are so rough, he doesn't take care of his hands. So it's really important to look at your fingers and nails, make sure that they're short and that the fingers are not rough, that you maintain the softness of the fingers and explore gently. The vulva is a very, very delicate uh, organ. It's a very delicate space. It needs to be explored gently. And there's a different technique called a hand-on-hand -hand technique, which I teach couples who come to see me about how to teach your partner how to explore your genitals. It all does come down to communicating and teaching your partner how you want to be stimulated and what you find agreeable and what you find disagreeable. Also understanding that blame, shame, guilt and criticism are some of the biggest turnoffs. If you're always angry and upset with your partner, the possibility of you having a great sexual encounter diminishes greatly. That's very insightful, ma'am. Ma'am, now tell me, uh, what is afterplay? Why is it important? And what difference does it make to a couple relationship? If I tell you the story of this lady, and I'm sure many of our audience will resonate um, with her story. And she came to me and says, you know what? Whenever we have sex, 
it finishes and then he just turns over and goes to sleep and he starts snoring he's that exhausted when i ask him the next day why can't we just cuddle after we've had sex i really want to tell you uh, how i enjoyed it he says well i'm just so tired and exhausted i just close my eyes and go to sleep he says well why can't we sleep in each other's arms i don't like to be disturbed uh, once i've had uh, sex and i've had my orgasm the trouble with this kind of encounter is that it fails to anchor the happy sensations and thoughts that you experience uh, with a great sexual encounter both men and women like afterplay so it's a myth that only women need afterplay a lot of the afterplay can be with stroking with talking with discussing what went well during the sexual encounter with giving your partner positive feedback about what they did that allowed you to have a very pleasurable experience the truth is after play of a sexual encounter can very easily spill into foreplay of the following sexual encounter and what do i mean by that it means the way you integrate after play into your sexual experience and how much you help your partner to anchor pleasure positive vibes positive feedback actually determines how ready they will be for the next sexual encounter so in a way you're setting the scene for the next episode of sex that both of you want to experience if you want it to be pleasurable exciting and amazing then that's the kind of after play you need to indulge in so for example if you've had a very relaxed and slow sexual encounter and you'd like your next sexual encounter to be a little bit spicier and more exciting that's something that you need to incorporate in your after play so you might give the feedback and say that was amazing but just imagine if we could do this next time and you whisper in their ear and you stroke them a little bit and say my god let's make it spicy next time then you're setting the scene for a spicy encounter next time and you can let your imagination run wild and use a little bit of fantasy to spice up the after play so that when you decide to have sex next time you both of you are already thinking about how to make it spicy and here is the last question what is the role of lubricants sex toys dressing up in foreplay and arousal this is a really interesting question in my experience not many couples actually give themselves permission to explore sex toys lubricants dressing up as part of their sexual repertoire it's about widening the experience of arousal and using different props and different experiences to make it new and exciting and stop it from becoming boring using different kinds of lubricants massage oils can create a different sensuous experience in foreplay leading up to intercourse and also for after play sex toys in particular are very good for arousal both for men and women and it can take some of the work away in terms of getting a woman aroused or getting a man aroused sex toys are also very good at helping both men and women to extend their pleasure for longer before uh, orgasming dressing up um even exploring some aspects of say handcuffs or blindfolds these are all ways of bringing in variety intrigue um excitement and a spiciness that makes sex less boring and less predictable if you imagine your last encounter if you knew everything that your partner was going to do then very likely your sex life is going to become very boring very quickly if things become boring we don't want to do them as often so it's important to include some of these toys games ways of speaking ways of interacting with each other ways of getting excited into one's sexual repertoire it's like uh, having a buffet of choices that one or the other partner can make to make the sex life spicier make it more of a conversation point so they're not always complaining about you know how the gardening needs to be done rubbish needs to be taken out or you know the school this fees need to be pay, paid or groceries need to be done how do you ease out if you've got into a habit of making sex boring because you've started to talk about these things when you're in bed together how do you ease it out is by incorporating more variety more excitement maybe a talking point that's new or exciting it might be sexy laundry it might be something else it might be a game or a toy anything that gets you talking and thinking about sex differently will make 
sex more pleasurable will actually make foreplay less predictable and a lot more exciting. I hope these questions have given you some idea about how to spice up your foreplay and how to make sex a lot more exciting. I look forward to speaking to you about more such things that make sex pleasurable and exciting in a future podcast. I want to invite you to a very unique couples retreat where I give my individual and personalized attention for 15 days in a residential workshop for couples who want to overcome discomfort and pain during sex, including conditions like vaginismus, where they learn the role of the pelvic floor, mutual satisfaction, understanding communication about their needs and preferences, understanding how to communicate with the outside world and how to boost couple self-esteem. In this unique workshop where I give my personal attention, I can only take eight couples at a time. If it's something that you're interested in, get in touch with me to see if you're eligible to participate in such a workshop. Remember to like, subscribe and share this podcast with whoever you think needs to hear it. If you'd like to talk to me one-on-one for a personal consultation, get in touch with me via my website www.drdrneelima.com Deshpande, D-E-S-H-P-A-N-D-E dot com. And you'll find a button there where you can click and book a slot with me. And I'll be sure to respond to any of your queries. Thank you. Disclaimer. This podcast is for general information purposes only. It does not constitute the practice of medicine, nursing or other professional healthcare services, including the giving of medical advice. No doctor-patient relationship is formed. The use of this information and the materials linked to this podcast is at the user's or listener's own risk. The content on this podcast is not intended to be a substitute for professional medical advice, diagnosis or treatment.